Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is, happy whatever day it is. Welcome to episode, I think it's 111, the left side of the aisle. Uh, I'm your host, my name is Larry Erickson, and for the next half hour, I'm going to be ranting away about you, uh, at you, at various things. Um, I hope you'll find them interesting, I hope you'll find them worthwhile. If you have any reactions to the show, you can reach me at my email address, whoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G, at AOL.com. And you can also go to my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time. You can comment there or you can get the email address from there. So with that quick introduction, let's get to it. I always like to start when I can with some good news. And here's something that I think is really good news. Last week, fast food uh, workers in Seattle, Washington, walked off their jobs in a one-day strike. That made Seattle the seventh city in the last couple of months to have fast food workers go on strike. Workers from chains including McDonald's, Burger King, Taco Bell, Subway, Arby's, Chipotle, Codoba, and Jack in the Box participated in the strike. The cities previously affected by these one-day walkouts were New York, Chicago, Milwaukee, St. Louis, Detroit, and Washington, D.C. Although I should say in the case of Washington, D.C., not all of those who struck were actually fast food workers. They were fast food workers and there were others as well. The Seattle strike, this latest strike, comes two weeks after the New York uh, fast food workers movement released a report alleging rampant wage theft in the fast food industry. And um, 83% of workers reported some form of wage theft. Now that can include uh, if you're being made to work before or after your shift, work for free. If you work overtime without getting overtime pay, uh, if, you're ha- if you have to work through your breaks or if you don't get breaks at all, or if you're a delivery employee who doesn't get reimbursed for things like travel expenses uh, or safety equipment. What's more, these strikes came just hours after the Congressional Progressive Caucus announced plans for a nationwide tour to focus on, quoting them, to highlight the problem of stagnant and low wages for American workers. And the workers in these uh, strikes are among the lowest paid. They're asking for a wage increase up to $15 an hour uh, and the right to form unions without intimidation. All right, so the point is here, why are low wages and exploited workers good news? Well, they're not. What is good news is, again, is that some American workers are finally fed up enough with the treatment that they're getting, uh, that they're prepared to do something about it, and the fact that these strikes have all occurred in cooperation with local community groups. And that is good news. From there, I actually have to update something. Uh, last week I talked about something. I have to issue an update on it. Uh, I said as was reported at the time, that supporters of same-sex marriage in Illinois, in the Illinois House of Representatives, were confident that they had the votes to get a bill for that passed before the legislative session ended on May 31st. Uh, It didn't work out that way. State, uh, State Representative Greg Harris, who's the chief sponsor of the bill, addressed the House on the evening of the last day of the session and announced he wouldn't be calling the vote because House colleagues had asked him for more time to consider it. Now, this marriage equality bill had already been passed by the state Senate, and Governor Pat Quinn had already said it would be signed. So the only barrier to its passage was the House of Representatives. Now, it won't be considered until the fall at the earliest. Harris said, I've never been sadder, and he literally teared up as he was making his announcement. But he also added, quoting, we will be back and we will be voting on this bill in this legislature in this room. Until then, I apologize to the families who were hoping they would wake up tomorrow as full equal citizens of the state. And happily, um, Harris remains confident that the bill will pass. Um, until then, though, the, uh, the sting of defeat is being felt by a lot of people. But even now, even in the face of that, there are still some good signs on this whole issue. Across the nation, one of the main driving forces against marriage equality has been the Catholic Church. And there are signs that the Church's influence on this issue are waning. Uh, for example, just recall last month, Rhode Island which is uh, the most Catholic state in the most Catholic region of the country, became the last state in that region, New England, to approve of same-sex marriage. 
And a good part of the reason for this, for this waning influence, is that polls are increasingly showing that the Catholic Church hierarchy is out of step with rank-and-file Catholics. Uh, according to a February poll by CBS News New York Times, 62% uh, of American Catholics believe that same-sex marriage should be legal. Uh, there are still battles to be fought. There will still be losses to endure. But I've said it before, and I will say it again. On this issue, if perhaps on no other issue, but on this issue, we're winning. All right, next, a very quick RIP. Uh, New Jersey Senator Frank Lautenberg has died at the age of 89. I mention him, well, actually for two reasons. Uh, one is that uh, he was the oldest senator. Uh, he was the only remaining World War II veteran in the Senate and uh, quite probably the only uh, remaining child of the Depression in the entire Congress. Uh, now, Lautenberg was always a liberal in the, in the good classic sense. The, he's not a radical by any means, by any means, but like a good solid Democratic Party liberal at a time when that still meant something rather than being a cause for sneering dismissal. Among his last acts in the Senate were to be brought to the Senate chambers in a wheelchair in order to vote for gun control and filing a bill calling for um, a background checks on the sale of explosive powders. This was done in the wake of the Boston Marathon bombing. And the thing is, maybe it was just like, you know, we're talking about the 19, he was first elected in 1982, so we're talking about the 1980s and so on, uh, and into, into the 1990s. And, and so maybe it was just a contrast between him and, and Shrub. But I recall saying of him at one time that, um, well, he seemed to be moving, over the course of his time in office, he did seem to move at least a little to the left, especially on environmental issues. In fact, I said of him once, and this is actually the other reason for mentioning him, I said of him once that he stood as counterproof to the argument that you must get more conservative as you grow older. In fact, it was apparently possible to grow more liberal. Now, there were, of course, a lot of reasons to criticize Frank Lautenberg from the left. A lot of reasons, but that's not the point here. I'm not going to go into that. Because for today, I would rather remember him as, again, proof that uh, progressivism does not rely on age. It relies on insight and understanding. So RIP Frank Lautenberg. From there, we're going to uh, one of our regular weekly features, the Clown Award, given on a regular basis for acts of meritorious stupidity. Uh, and in fact, this week I have to tell you, there's two of them, because I had two top candidates and I actually couldn't choose between them. So I voted at a tie and inducted both of them into the Clown Hall of Fame. Uh, our first winner of the Big Red Nose goes to Representative Marsha Blackburn of Tennessee. Now, she embraces all the usual right-wing jackassery. Um, she opposed Hurricane Sandy relief after accepting federal aid when floods hit her district. Uh, she claims action against global warming will, quote, destroy millions of American jobs and damage our economic competitive for dec decades to come. Uh, she tries to defund Planned Parenthood. But... At times, she actually goes well beyond the usual. In 2011, she gave light bulbs as Christmas gifts because there was this fantasy that the government was going to ban incandescent bulbs, so she was giving people a stock of them before the government banned them. So her status as a clown is well established, okay? But she is the gift that keeps on giving. On June 2nd, she went on Meet the Press and said that women don't want equal pay laws. They don't want, she said, they don't want the decisions made in Washington. They want to be able to have the power and control and the ability to make those decisions for themselves. What decisions is she talking about? The decisions that, they, that women want to freely decide to be underpaid? That they want to freely decide to get paid less for equal work or for equal worth? I mean, you know, she did vote against the Lily Ledbetter Act and the Paycheck Fairness Act, so maybe that's, yeah, maybe that is what she means. Or maybe she means that what women really want is for American corporations to just, out of the sheer goodness of their hearts, out of their sheer decency, to simply pay women as much as they pay men. Look how well that's worked out so far. 
Uh, despite literally decades of pushing, women still earn significantly less than men for the work, same kind of work, work of the same value. In 2012, in fact, in fact, that, that gap has actually grown some over the last few years. In 2012, women earned less than 81% of what men work, for, uh, gain rather, for the equivalent work. According to one recent analysis, over the course of a 40-year career, a typical average American, U, uh, American woman can expect to lose out on $443,000 in income, which frankly will pay for a lot of clown makeup for Marsha Blackburn. Our other winner of the Big Red Nose this week is a man who is not only a clown, I believe he's also a self-serving hypocrite and a phony. He's Fox business reporter John Stossel. Last week, he told the host of Fox and Friends that government programs should be cut, that whole government programs should disappear, whole departments should disappear. To show the intellectual depth of his analysis, he said, for example, why do we have a commerce department? Commerce just happens which would probably seem to be a good argument to somebody who actually thinks the government says that, the, that there would be no commerce if the Commerce Department didn't exist. Uh, the Department of Agriculture is unnecessary because farmers do that. He also wants to get rid of the Department of Education, apparently thinks education is something else that just happens. But the award of the Big Red Nose this week is actually for something in particular. In the course of the same interview, he made the astonishingly lame brain claim that before the modern welfare state came into existence, no one died of starvation. Quoting, think about the Great Depression. That was before there was any welfare state at all. How many people starved? No one. Well, in fact, the number of cases of starvation in New York City alone went from 20 in 1931 to 110 in 1934. There were so many accounts of people dying of starvation in New York City that the West African nation of Cameroon sent the city $3.77 in relief. And malnutrition is a much bigger problem. A 1933 study of 514 children in New York found that more than a third were in poor or very poor health. And the fact is, a lot more people die of starvation than the numbers indicate. Starvation is rarely listed as a cause of death on records. Because, and that's because people rarely die literally of lack of food. That, that actually is very rare. What happens is people die of some injury or some illness that would not have killed them had they not been starving. They actually died as the result of the starvation, but the cause of death will be listed as the illness. So the fact is many more people die of starvation than the raw numbers indicate. Um, Stossel, in the face of this, later made uh, what has become for him a standard, typical non-apology apology is what happens when he gets challenged. He said, and he said this, by the way, on his Twitter account on his blog. He didn't say this on the air where a lot more people heard it and a lot more people would hear the kind of not really but sort of retraction. No, he said it where fewer people would know about it. He said it was dumb to say no one died of starvation, but then claimed that governors at the time said there was no starvation, and he cited a study claiming that the depression was actually good for people's health. In other words, his retraction was actually a way of making the same anti-government argument, just in a different way. And that's about as clownish as they come. Oh, and by the way, why do I say he's a self-serving hypocrite and a phony? Because I remember him from WCBS-TV in New York City, where at a time when consumer, uh, consumer protection was a big issue, he was the hotshot consumer reporter, uncovering malfeasance and misfeasance in corporations and local businesses alike. But right around 1980, Right around the time when the right wing came to power in the form of the Reagan administration and right wing media was on the rise, right at that time, he claimed with remarkably convenient timing to have discovered the magic of the marketplace and turn himself into the extreme business good government bad fruitcake that he is today. Bluntly, I think if the pendulum swings, swings back the other way soon enough, he will suddenly, miraculously rediscover 
the need for close regulation of the economy and for public assistance. And with that, we're taking a break. Here we go. We're back. And a um, little, little fun about this. Once in a while, there's something in, in a news item that strikes me in an odd way. Uh, specifically, there's something, some, usually some little thing, that the coverage just doesn't seem to address. Now, calling it little doesn't necessarily mean it's unimportant, although sometimes it is. Sometimes it's just something I find amusing or a little irritating or something. But uh, sometimes it's, it's important. But what it really means, the little thing, really means is that it's something that's glossed over, something that's maybe mentioned in passing but deserves more attention than it got. So this is the first of a new and very occasional feature called the little thing. And to get it started, I have two of them this week to get us going. Uh, first up is the news that Starbucks has announced a, a policy of, as of June 1st, of requiring smokers to stand at least 25 feet away from the businesses when they light up. Uh, it already bans smoking indoors. A company representative said about 7,000 stores will be affected, both those that have outdoor seating and those that don't, although the ones that are inside another store, like a Target or something, uh, they're not going to be affected. All right, so here's the thing. Most of the coverage about this was about how affecting the outdoor seating is kind of a new area, and there was discussion about how or even if this would affect the company's business. But none of the coverage that I saw asked a very obvious question. Starbucks, just who the hell do you think you are? You want to ban smoking in your palaces of overpriced lattes? You go right ahead. You want to extend that, pro that, that to property that you control on the sidewalk where you have seating and so on? Fine, go right ahead. Your place, your rules. But where do you get off thinking that you can just control the behavior of people on a public sidewalk on areas that are not within your control? Where do you get off thinking you can just tell people what they can and can't do? I mean, it's really, when you think about it, it's really just creepy. And what's really creepy about this is how the coverage of this seemed to take it as a matter of course that a corporation could do this. That a corporation could just say, hey, you, you can't smoke that. Why not 50 feet? Just the idea that it was taken for granted that a corporation could just do this. Could, con could control people's behavior on a place that a corporation does not physically control. That's a little thing that didn't get mentioned. I think that's important, though. All right, for the other one, this is more for the fun of it. Recently, President Hopi Changi announced how he wants to end the global war on terror, except that he doesn't really want to. I mean, the secrecy remains, and it appears that the biggest change is that the drone war is going to be run by the Pentagon instead of the CIA, and Bradley Manning is still on trial. But leave that aside to, to enjoy one of the most delicious Freudian slips you will ever hear. In response to the amazing Mr. O's speech, Senator Lindsey Graham, member in good standing of the Brotherhood of Perpetual Smirk, said, quoting him, at the end of the day, this is the most tone-deaf president I could ever imagine, making such a speech at a time when our homeland is trying to be attacked literally every day. Yep. Lindsey Graham says the homeland says that we are trying to be attacked. And if that ever actually happened, just whose interest would that serve? From there, all right, on to our other regular weekly feature, the outrage of the week. Uh, you know what's one of the worst things about the Supreme Court? On too many issues, the members of the court are faced with cases involving scientific or technical issues, and they are called upon to make decisions which they are not competent to make. By the narrowest majority, five to four, the Supreme Court has cleared the way for police at all levels to take a DNA swab from anyone they arrest for a serious crime and to use that evidence to try to match them to previous crimes without evidence that they are suspected of any other crime, without a warrant, and directly contrary to the long-standing understanding of the Fourth Amendment that police can't search for evidence of a crime without individualized suspicion. And as Stephen Shapiro of the ACLU noted, all nine justices agreed that doing this match is a search. But from the majority, that didn't matter. 
Because according to the opinion written by Anthony Kennedy, a DNA swab is no different from a fingerprint or a photograph. It's, it's just part of a booking procedure, just a, just a way to identify the prisoner. He actually called it, as such things always invariably are called, a minor intrusion. No big deal. But of course it's not a big deal. And the majority showed itself to be abysmally ignorant of just how revealing DNA is. Your face is your face. Your fa fingerprints are your fingerprints. Your DNA is who you are. Advocates of swabbing, and, and you know they're advocates of swabbing, because no matter what it is, there's always going to be people who say, oh, we absolutely have to be able to do this, otherwise crime will run rampant and the entire world will fall apart. There's always people who are going to be saying that. Anyway, advocates of swabbing insist that a cheek swab is deliberately chosen because it doesn't tell you anything beyond your identity. That's not true. It can reveal who you may be related to. In fact, there's a whole growing industry of people who voluntarily submit uh, cheek swabs in hopes of finding relatives. Um, they're also used in determining paternity. They're used in some immigration cases. They're used in matching patients for bone marrow transplants and other sort of medical matches. They can be used to, relieve, uh, to, re uh, to reveal your medical history, including what kind of conditions you might be susceptible to. Now, admittedly, several of those uses I just mentioned are voluntary. That's true, but it doesn't change the fact that a cheek swab tells a lot more about you than just like who you are. And to, to argue otherwise is utter and complete nonsense. And the fact is, beyond that, calling a, a cheek swab just a booking procedure and a minor intrusion demonstrates that the majority of the court doesn't know what it's talking about. And it was incompetent, technically incompetent, to reach the decision it reached. And now, because of their ignorance, another piece of the Fourth Amendment has been sliced away. That's especially true because the court's decision contains no limits on how this could be used. Um, in fact, um, it, well, let's put it this way. It involved a case of a violent crime in Maryland. But uh, in an insightful dissent, Antonin Scalia and there are six words I never thought I'd say together in that order. In an insightful dissent, Antonin Scalia. But still, he noted the slippery slope involved, that there's nothing in this decision to prevent it from being expanded to other uses. Uh, in fact, Maryland state officials even agreed. The state attorney general of Maryland said that there's nothing in this to prevent his state from now taking the swabs of anyone arrested for any reason, even for something minor like shoplifting. In fact, Scalia said, why stop at people arrested? Why not take your DNA when you fly in an airplane? Doesn't the Homeland Security need to know the identity of people flying planes? In fact, why not do it just when your kids first go to school? We'll have a DNA swab of everybody. Why not? In fact, all 50 states and the federal government already take swabs on people convicted of crimes. According to court documents, the FBI's uh, coordinate, combined DNA index system, which is a coordinated system of federal, state, and local DNA profiles, already contains more than 10 million criminal records and 1.1 million records of people who have been arrested but not convicted. Now, according to the FBI, DNA samples for those who are not charged, whose charges are dropped or whatever, they're supposed to, those records are supposed to be expunged but those restrictions do not apply to states and municipalities. Open wide. All right. I got, got, I got a couple of minutes for this. It's going to be the last thing. Uh, it deserves more time than I'm going to give it, but every time I try to do it, my stomach starts to knot up, so I got to do it in little, little bits. As of June 4th, at least... 4,720 Americans, including at least 45 in Massachusetts, have been killed by gunfire since Newtown. That is 234 more than the total number of American soldiers killed in the eight years of the Iraq War. But things, I, I need to talk about this because I need to talk about the dirty little secret of the gun control issue. There is one way, that dirty little secret is that there is one way in which the gun nuts are right. All the proposals, at least the serious proposals, the, the ones that the political and social elites will dare to raise for fearing that going beyond that is politically infeasible, 
Those serious proposals will do little to control our shocking rate of death by gun. If every one of those proposals passed, and they should pass, make no mistake about it, but if every one of those proposals passed, it would make only a small difference in the gun murder rate and the overall gun death rate. Why? Because the proposals arise from, and they're driven by, the shocks to our conscience from events like Aurora and Newtown. But those assaults are almost exclusively done with like assault weapons, uh, rapid fire with uh, high capacity magazines. Such events might take the lives of hundreds of people a year. But that is a fraction of the thousands of deaths, both by murder and accident, that occur every year in this country as the result of handguns. And that is the dirty little secret that most of the death, most of the murder, is by the thing that nobody is talking about. Because beyond the standard thing of background checks, nobody even mentions handguns. In fact, this is not always true. Uh, in fact, not even handgun control, a ban on handguns, was once common currency. In 1959, 60% of Americans told a Gallup poll that they supported a ban on handguns, except for people who could actually show a need for them. By 2011, this is before Aurora, before Newtown, before those managed to sufficiently shock our national conscience to get gun control back on the agenda, Gallup said support in 2011, support for gun control as an issue had fallen to its lowest level in 50 years. But even at that point, even at that lowest level, 26% of people favored a ban on handguns. So if you raise it, people will try to make, it, make you think it's a fringe issue, but it's not. Don't be afraid to say it, because it shouldn't be a fringe issue. We are an incredibly violent nation. We have whole neighborhoods terrorized by guns, by handguns, not shotguns, not AR-15s, by handguns. Whole neighborhoods where people's big dream is to be able to go for a walk in the evening without risking their lives. And that's not going to change. It is not going to stop. It is not going to change until we do at least two things. One, we have to recognize how much crime is actually driven by social and economic inequalities. And two, we ban handguns and stop accepting the dirty little secret. That's it. I'm done. I'm out of here. I will see you next week. You have the best week you possibly can. Stay safe.